falls, rises, theta bops, rock slams, rocket reeds, floating needles, and more, all of it ready for display at the touch of a button. As one moves up the levels, his dependency on the meter to locate the right parts of his case to run increases. No PC indicators, no, I feel it might be this, or when I was young, my mother said such and such. At the highest levels, you are dealing with parts of the track that are much, much earlier than mama. And to find it, you need the meter. Imagine, you're a pre-OT on a super high OT level. You're 80 trillion years down the track, locked in the mother of all incidents. <laughs> Don't you want to be sure your auditor knows the next command? <laughs> Especially since that auditor is you. <laughs> Welcome, friends, to yet another installment of the Rays in the Secret Society series. I figured we'd start off with a hit of the pipe because we're definitely going to be going down into some dark, strange, cavernous areas known as the operating Thetan levels of Scientology. So join me with your drug of choice as we talk about the most ludicrous aspect of the cult and how it is that I came to be convinced of the following material. Words from a book showed me the way To be free of the shadows of yesterday Knowing the truth will set us free And take us from clear to eternity so, we're picking up the storyline from right where we left off in the last episode, where, having achieved the exalted bullshit state of Scientology clear, I finally arrive at the infamous level of OT3, where we will unlock the briefcase to discover the ancient secrets as to why this world is so fucked up. The fourth invader force was here, the fifth invader force came in, and the name of this solar system is Space Station 33. The fourth invader force had been there for God knows how many skillion years have been sitting down. So I was living right across the street from the Hollywood brainwashing headquarters known as Scientology Celebrity Center when I attested to the state of clear. And now it's time for me to head over to L. Ron Hubbard Way. Yes, there's an actual street in Los Angeles named L. Ron Hubbard Way to the famous Big Blue Building. Now, right down the street from this ominous blue building lies the Advanced Organization Los Angeles, where the secret confidential levels are delivered. Okay, so at this point in the ongoing story, I'm 30 years old and I had just attested to the state of clear. Now, after a Scientologist achieves the state of clear, between that state and the time he gets up to what's called OT3, he is in the danger zone, or what Scientology calls the non-interference zone. To make sense of this madness briefly, what happens is, supposedly, according to Scientology, is that once you achieve the state of clear, that relieves all pain and unconsciousness in this lifetime, therefore opening up your subconscious mind to parts of the track, i.e. your past lives, that are now available to you because you've achieved the state of clear. Because that's available, until you get to the secret, which is only revealed on OT3, you're in danger of having that unconscious part of what happened to you in the past impinge upon your life today and possibly cause you to get into accidents up to and including dying. So they try to get Scientologists through to OT3 as quickly as possible. Again, it's just another gimmick to make more money or whatever. But nonetheless, I was scared shitless after I achieved clear and very desperately wanted to go through all the levels. Now we're gonna be covering specifically solo auditor course part one, which is what you do right after you become clear, solo auditor course part two, OT preparations, OT eligibility, and OT levels one, two, and three. That's as far as I got up before I went insane 
Now it's estimated to be about a half million dollars to get up to the top OT8, but realistically, it's more like a million dollars by the time you add in all the fucking bullshit contributions you have to make along the way. Now at this time, I was still doing background work in movies, which we talked about previously, and I had kind of worked myself up the ranks to do the highest paid background work, which is in commercials. And also, if you book a commercial and you do it on the weekend, you make double the money. So back in 2003, when I was trying to do as little work as possible by doing background work, I was making $600 a day just by showing up. And then often that would go into over $1,000 by the time you would add in meal penalties and all sorts of things that come with being a part of the union. Um, I was also dog sitting. So in between the times that I wasn't um, wasting my life away and my brain away on set doing background work, I worked for a gal named Mary Parent. Mary Parent was a producer uh, at Universal Pictures. She was vice chairman or vice president, some fucking high position. And I would stay at her house overlooking Sunset Boulevard, this huge, gorgeous house, um, just taking care of this dog named Sammy, by the way. And we're going to cover Sammy and what happened with this job and Mary Parent um, when we get up to OT3, because there's a story to tell about that. Okay, so with that background, let's go up the levels to OT3. So after a person achieves clear, they are to immediately route on to the solo auditor course part one. Whereas in the beginning levels, the non-confidential levels of Scientology, you have another auditor or psychotherapist auditing you. In this course, you're going to learn how to do it solo or by yourself. So get a load of this shit. This is the main first policy that I read after achieving clear and that anybody does that sort of introduces you to the seriousness of the sojourn that you're about to begin. HCO policy letter of 17 January 1967, an open letter to all clears. You were clear. Well done and congratulations. This state has not previously been attained in this universe and we must all work towards getting more people, many more people, up to this level. Essentially, you were clear on the first dynamic, that means self, and still have a lot of work in front of you to attain OT which is to say the remaining dynamics, but nevertheless, you will find you have many abilities hitherto undreamed of. An ethical code already exists for OTs, so at the state of clear, one should not assume one has a license to do whatever one will. You still have the remaining dynamics to go, so don't use your abilities you have attained already to enslave others, or indeed yourself. With freedom comes responsibility, and with responsibility comes the need to assess one's actions, and to take only such actions as will do the greatest good over the greatest number of dynamics. So, the policies of Scientology, which have enabled you to reach the state of clear, still applies to all clears. In fact, they apply more because you have the reality of their value and the necessity of seeing that they are followed. Those who have not yet attained clear will be watching you with some awe, so you have the duty of setting an example of exemplary behavior in all aspects of your life. As a clear, you have no privileges beyond being declared clear. As a result, bigger responsibilities will be given and expected of you, so you must be prepared to responsibly educate yourself where necessary so that you can do whatever is assigned to you in a proper manner in keeping with the main goals and aims of Scientology. So for you, there is no sitting down and resting on your laurels, you piece of shit. No waving of policy, no promiscuous second dynamic activities. That means uh, family and sex and shit like that. No improper assumption of power, control, or influence, or assuming that you automatically know best in every situation. It is a crime to invalidate the state of clear, so see to it that you don't do this in your conduct as a clear, particularly as regards yourself. You still have the rest of your dynamics to go, you piece of shit. You have now become more than ever a part of a team. Obsessive individualism and a failure to organize were responsible for getting us into the state we got into. As soon as you have gone the rest of the way, this will become abundantly plain. I expect and need your help to carry out the broad mission of decontaminating this area of the universe. If you wish to help, 
Your first duty is to protect the repute of the state of clear by exemplary conduct. Your second duty is to attain OT as quickly as possible. Your third, if you wish to help, is to become part of the endeavor to clean up this sector of the universe and make it safe not only for ourselves, but the billions of others who have been harmed. As a clear, you are welcome and honored. Don't do anything that will wear out your welcome or bring dishonor on yourself or upon other clears, you absolute dipshit. Thank you for what you have done so far. Thank you for what you will do in the future. And of course, I know I can count on you. L. Ron Hubbard, founder, 1967. So, bonded by blood in this mission to save this sector of the universe, I enthusiastically cracked open that solo or solo auditor course pack and got to work on how to use that fucking e-meter. Now, that piece that you just saw sounded very reminiscent of Star Wars, right? How in the hell would anybody buy into this ludicrousness called Scientology? So this requires an explanation before we continue about how to sum up Scientology. The reason we're doing so many different videos and those following along will see the complexity of it is because there's many, many different elements, as mentioned before, that Hubbard stole from. Everything from Freudian and Jungian psychology to philosophies of the East to um, Crowley and Gnosticism, uh, mind control techniques, NLP. He stole everything from everywhere and put it into this thing called Scientology. But it can be summed up with two basic philosophies. At the core of Scientology is uh, Crowley. L. Ron Hubbard was a huge fan of Aleister Crowley when he first ran across his works and when he was 15 years old. The Book of the Law is the first book that he read and got electrified by. And the entirety of Scientology from 15 years old up to when he created this cult all the way until he died, that was the philosophy that he believed in. He thought he was literally Satan incarnate. Crowley died in 1947. He took the mantle of the beast from Crowley and believed that he was Satan. That's what Scientology, that's what's at the core. And we'll get into that more in this video as we go. And it's also based on Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the idea that this is a prison planet outside of our reality, which is called the third dimension, exists other entities and beings um, in the fourth and fifth dimension. L. Ron Hubbard referred to these as the fourth and fifth invader forces. Gnosticism had a version of that where these entities were called archons, and their version of Satan was a character named Yaldabaoth. Uh, the, the Satan version of Scientology is called Xenu, which is what OT3 is about to be discussed as we carry on. And in every religious tradition, they have a version of Satan and the demons that um, Satan kind of puts to work. If you take the Islamic faith, they call their version of the demons the jinn, which is where we get the word genie from. And these are said to be fire, smokeless entities that again, exist right outside of the third dimension, visible light right out in what they call the fourth dimension. Christians, you know, have Satan and their version of these entities would be called uh, demons, etc. right? So Scientology is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, like we said, in these cults and these secret societies and this mind control, it's been around since ancient times. All we're looking at today with Scientology and the like is sort of a perfection and a culmination of a long process. So with that background, um, I wanna introduce you to Scientology super adamant about defining all their words. You have to look up everything. So what the hell does clear mean and what does operating fate mean? I'm gonna throw you a couple of definitions and then we'll continue up this bridge. But when we get to the Crowley part, Note um, what those definitions are actually saying, and then also note the vagary of these definitions. So you're constantly like projecting onto these definitions and these words that L. Ron Hubbard is creating, and we'll get more into that, um, your own ideas of what they mean because they're so vague. That's actually part of the hypnosis. So let's define these words and then we'll carry on. So the definition of a clear is a thetan, that's a spiritual being, who can be at cause knowingly and at will over mental matter, energy, space, and time. And the definition of an operating Thetan, or OT, is a Thetan who can be at cause, knowingly and at will, over thought, life, matter, 
energy, space, and time, both subjective and objective. In other words, you're a fucking god with godlike abilities, and you have the ability to determine using your will, what they call in Scientology, making a tone 40 postulate, the highest level intention you can have, to determine the outcome of not only your own life, but everybody and everything around you. This is why Scientologists can be so annoying, so arrogantly confident, and downright um, just horrible to be around because they're so certain. They can't just leave you alone. You know, this is what I'm talking about with my parents, why it's kind of unacceptable, although they'll claim otherwise, for me not to be a Scientologist because a Scientologist knows that they need to determine and be at cause over all of life. That's why they fuck with your life and they try to change the world and they try to change you and get you to get into Scientology. This is what's going on inside uh, a Scientologist's head and what's going on inside of my head. So on this solo course, I spent months learning how to use this machine, which they call an e-meter. Now the very next video is all about the e-meter, auditing, the questions asked, summing up all the videos we've done and putting into a nice little neat package about how this whole hypnosis machine works. So don't worry if you don't understand the terminology, we're gonna cover all of that. But here's a quick example of what uh, I spent months doing on the solo course, learning how to perfect this stupid e-meter. And in this example, you're gonna see a guy named Bobby Lyons, who we've discussed in previous videos. And he was my acting teacher for a long period of time when I was in the cult. And here he is demonstrating using something called the E-Meters Drill Simulator about what a Scientologist is actually doing on this solo course. This is the new Hubbard E-Meter Drill Simulator. The keypad has a series of buttons, each one representing a different read. This is a tick. You can produce many other types of reads, including a rocket read, a dirty needle, a rock slam, and even a floating needle. Now let's see what an actual drill looks like. The coach has the drill simulator and a drills pack, which tells him precisely what to do each step of the drill. He just follows the instructions and ensures the student responds exactly per the scripted drill. For this demonstration, they are going to fly the ARC brake rudiment. The CS is to fly a rude. Okay. Start of drill. Do you have an ARC brake? The script instructs the coach to produce a one-inch fall on the next question. On the question, do you have an ARC break? Has anything been suppressed? Do you have an ARC break? Um, yeah, I, I do actually. Uh, this morning I found my canary dead and I took a little bit of a loss on that. Thank you. Was that a break in affinity? Reality? Communication? Understanding? Was that a break in understanding? Yeah, yeah, it was a break in understanding. Thank you. I'd like to indicate- Every meter read the coach is to produce using the drill simulator is specifically called for in the script. Was it no understanding? Flunk, that's it. You should have said, was it in force understanding? That's the longest read, see here? The coach refers the student to the exact source reference which is given right in the script. Together, they clear up the students' misunderstoods. And then, they return to the drill at the same spot and continue. It's understanding. Uh. These drills cover every type of situation that could possibly happen. Compiled from every LRH written reference and tape lecture related to the technical procedure being drilled. By the time these students have gotten through this level of drilling and can do it flawlessly, they have a total command of that technical procedure. And here's how it looks. Here we go. Start of drill. Now, having completed the solo auditor course part one and learning how to use that e-meter like an expert, 
there's still three more steps to do before you are invited onto the first of the magical OT levels. And those steps are OT preparations, solo auditor course part two, and the dreadful, scary OT eligibility step. So OT preparations is a series of steps to make sure that you're ready for auditing and that you don't have any attention on previous auditing, etc. Now, I had a shitload of steps to do on this particular action in the way of handling past ethics conditions, getting some auditing to handle my evil intentions, and particularly having to redo, for the third time, a huge Scientology course called the PTSSP course. The PTSSP course, briefly, is a really long course this designed to spot all the suppressives or people that are against Scientology in your life and then slowly but surely remove them. This is a major course on what any cult does on how to get people out of your life that are hindering your spiritual progress. This usually has to do with anybody that's trying to point out that you're in a cult and wake you the fuck up. Now, after OT preps, I did Solo Auditor Course Part 2. Solo Auditor Course Part 2 is where you go into a locked room with the e-meter and your briefcase, to be explained shortly, to learn how to put to practical use what you learn on the Solo Auditor Course. Now, check this out. Only about 5%, maybe 10% at the most, of Scientologists actually get up to these OT levels. So when you spout the word Xenu or any other confidential material on these levels, know that you're not making any impact on the Scientologists because they have no idea what you're talking about. Now, when you sign up for Solo Auditor Course Part 2, things get serious in the way of... I had a Sea Org member. This is the person that signs a billion year contracts that wears the intimidating Navy uniforms and works full time for the next billion years for the organization. Now, one of these members came to my house and they have to make sure that I have a locked room in which to do these solo auditing courses. And they have to make sure that everything is secure. Additionally, I'm now to wear a briefcase strapped on me with a dog leash Everywhere I go, whenever I check out the materials, which you do in the morning, and then you have to return them at night, but the entire time that you have these materials on you, you have to keep them in this briefcase secret, and you can never open them up. Now, you also sign this contract that says if you speak anything about the OT levels to anyone, if you do any breach of security, i.e. you snitch on what these materials are about, they are going to fine you $100,000 for each infraction. There was one time when I accidentally left the briefcase open when I was in the waiting room to do the OT levels, which, by the way, is on the fourth floor of that AOLA building, that blue building that I showed you at the be beginning of this video. So that's where I'd go to check in and get my materials. And one day I accidentally left it open and they threatened to find me. Uh, they, they of course can't. These contracts aren't legally binding, but you don't know that when you're in the Truman Show bubble. We believe all this shit. So luckily they uh, decided to waive the $100,000 fee and I just had to do this long ethics condition about why I accidentally left the briefcase open where someone might see the secret materials. So anyways, um, we've got Solo Auditor Course 1 to recap. OT preparations to get your case in order, o, uh, solo course part two, where I went into this lock room with my briefcase at the a AOLA. They have to make sure you're checked out first before you can go home and do this shit. And then the next step was OT eligibility. Now, get a load of what this is. Now, like any secret society, you have to be invited onto their secret levels and they have to have enough blackmail material on you and enough information where they're going to make sure you don't spill the fucking secrets. Here's what they say about OT eligibility from one of their own promo pieces. Before you route onto your OT levels, you will need to receive an OT eligibility check. As the data on the OT courses is entrusted only to a being who is clean, in ethics, and contributing to the expansion of Scientology, Ron laid out specific requirements which you must meet to receive your invitation to the advanced courses. These courses are by invitation only. The invitation to a course depends on several factors. One, security of advanced course materials in the student's hands. Two, degree of participation the being has engaged in in Scientology. 
Three, the general character of the being as a Scientologist based on its ethics record. And four, the Scientology technical proficiency of the being, L. Ron Hubbard. Now, this is truly a bonding point with the cult or a crossing over to the other side with no return, if you will, because by the time I finished this OT eligibility, which is an auditing action, a security check, and also possible ethics actions that you might have to do as a result, they had everything on me. They get you to tell every crime, every little pass, misdeed that you've ever done, and they write it all down in their folders. Now, you think you're doing this because you're trying to get clean spiritually, and you always, you're always told that you have to be honest in Scientology to get case gain. And when you leave, however, that information is promptly retrieved from, uh, from the dungeon, and all that information is used against you. Hence, the bonding of the cult. This is also a, a main motivation why a lot of people don't leave the cult or speak out or whatever. Luckily, I didn't have too many skeletons in my closet. And I wouldn't give Scientology the pleasure of relisting everything that they already have in my folders. They can look it up themselves. But I didn't have too many skeletons in my closet, so they can't do a whole lot. But that does keep people in there because they get everything on you. And who's perfect? You know what I mean? Everybody probably has stuff. And they're absolutely vicious against using that against people. So I'm still 30 years old at this time. It's taken me about eight to nine months now since achieving clear to finally finish this eligibility and get the invitation to do OT1. Now check this shit out. Imagine spending 10 years and hundreds of thousands of dollars desperately trying to get up to these levels where you're finally gonna have these superpowers. Each level on the Scientology bridge has a specific ability gain that you're told is gonna happen that acts as both a post-hypnotic suggestion so that you know what to expect and also, as we were talking about before, notice the vagary of these wins and gains that you're promised. So OT1, at the end of that, it's said that you will have a fresh, causative OT viewpoint of the MEST, that means matter, energy, space, and time, universe, and other beings. I mean, imagine attesting to that. Yeah, I do feel like I have a fresh OT causative viewpoint. You know what people were doing on the original OT1? The one that I'm going to describe to you that I did is, is terrible enough, but imagine this. Back in the day, it, it was to go to a shopping mall or any place where there was a lot of people, a crowd of people, and you would just observe people until you had in Scientology what they call a cognition. That means realization, and that's a buzzword in Scientology. They're always trying to have cognitions or new realizations. So this poor sap in what, the 80s or 70s when this level was... Um, the original OT1 went down to a freaking shopping mall looking like a probably a predator and scaring people until they had this cognition. Now the version that I did wasn't a hell of a lot better. We basically had to run what they call problems type processes on people in our lives. So I'll give you an example of what happened. So there was a gal I was dating at the time named Melinda and she uh, was also trying to be an actress like I was. And during the um, auditing on OT1, she told me that she got cast in a part, a small part in a movie by Judd Apatow. I don't remember what the hell the name of it is, but I'll put it up right here. And I, because I was running these processes in OT1, I thought that I caused her to have that movie role. Now, mind you, I hadn't really done much at the time, but I had the power to get somebody else roles. Remember we were talking about intentions and postulates previously in this video? To, again, to put Scientology in context, it's all about you having the mental power to decide using your intention and thought alone what you want to have happen, not only in your own life, but controlling other people's universes. That's what makes it so terrifying. Anyways, I of course never told her that, but I secretly thought how powerful I was where I could cause her to get her first part in Hollywood. Now, after I completed OT1, which only took about a week, maybe a week and a half to do, and they always tell you, don't worry about OT1 and 2, it's OT3 that you need to get up to, which kind of um, just keeps you a carrot on the stick and makes you realize and not be too dissatisfied once you come to the realization of how stupid these OT levels are. Now, OT level 2 is the one that drove me the most insane 
And this is where you deal with what's called whole track implants. These are implants on the whole track, i.e. all your past lives, that all thetans or beings have in common. And these implants were called GPMs by Hubbard or Goals Problem Mass. And they go by such lovely names as the Arrow, Double Rod, Women, White Black Sphere, Hot Cold, Laughter Calm, and the infamous Dance Mob. GPM. And these implants contain dichotomies that fucked up the being, such as you must survive, you mustn't survive, you should survive, you shouldn't survive, you can survive, you can't survive. And after each of these implants, there's a shock, which you actually run as part of the process. So create shock, create no shock. Destroy shock, destroy no shock. Are you lost yet? Because I sure as fuck was opening this OT2 pack and going, what in the horse's ass is this? I thought I was trying, I thought I was going for abilities that were going to expand my mind and expand my awareness as a being. And I'm dealing with these ludicrous things called create shock, create no shock, love shock, no shock. This fucking level, by the way, is the one that looking back at it now uh, is clear as day set me up to have my mind cracked on OT3. That's when I really started to kind of begin the exit process. And this fucking OT2 fucked me up so badly that it was the beginning of my psychotic break and psychosis that I experienced later. I remember one time I came out of my apartment during a particularly good OT2 session and I was so spaced out of my mind. I remember thinking I shouldn't be driving right now. You know what's happening, which you talked about a lot? It's simply being disassociated, and disassociated gives you a floating feeling, and it can feel very good. That's where they get the floating needle, by the way. We'll talk about that more when we do the auditing video next. But nobody really likes auditing. I didn't like actually having to go through the process, but if you push hard enough, it was that high, it was that disassociation, it was that floating feeling, and... It was that altered state of consciousness that we and I were going for as Scientologists. And also, remember, this is the metaphysics that I grew up with. Even though I resisted Scientology um, as a kid, which we've talked about in previous videos, I still believed my dad knew what he was talking about, and I believed he really did have the answers. And if, he, if he's into Scientology, it must be legitimate. I must be the one that's bad. When I first started high school, my dad was auditing on OT3. And I remember I would be sitting on the couch watching television, you know, just eating food or whatever. And then as soon as he'd come home, I'd immediately sit up and pretend like I was doing something. I always was paranoid of my dad because I felt like he could read my mind. And he was doing this OT3, this solo auditing, right next door in a locked room when I was watching television. So even though my dad scared the shit out of me and still does to this day, you don't have any contact with him, but He's kind of a terrifying man with this Scientology running through his blood. And I hate to say that, but it's just, it's just the way that it is. So after I completed OT2, which took about three weeks, give or take, I was surprised because I thought this, these are supposed to be long and you pay good money for these fucking things. But it's sort of like, just hurry through these so we can get you onto OT3. So regards OT3. I finally get the invitation to do this level, and this is a very special day for any Scientologist. And my dad was super stoked too, and my parents, because I'm going to finally learn the secret. And so before I tell you this story, which is going to require um, a lot of detail, this is when I actually start to crack, and then finally I begin to wake up. I, you know, we talked about the... Um, the entity part earlier and how the various different religions, secret societies and cults sort of uh, believe in these demons. So the demon part on OT3 is called body thetans. And there's no better um, piece to show you on what the cosmology is of OT3 and Scientology than to show you the South Park clip, which just tells you exactly what it is that I fucking cracked open and read Character of Body Thetans. By the way, said with a lisp, that's Body Satans. Body Thetans are just Thetans. When you get rid of one, he goes off and possibly squares around, picks up a body, or admires daisies. He is, in fact, a sort of cleared being. He cannot fail to eventually, if not at once, regain many abilities. Many have been asleep for the last 75 million years. 
A body thetan responds to any process any thetan responds to. Some body thetans are suppressive. A suppressive is out of valence in R6. R6 is another word for the reactive mime. He is in valence in incident 1, to be discussed in OT3, almost always. One can't run a human being on these two incidents, since human beings are composites and would not be able to run the lot. Aside from that, non-clears are way below an awareness required to even find these incidents. Huge amounts of charge have already been removed from the case and the body satans, sorry, thetans, by clearing an OT1 and OT2, to say nothing of engrams and lower grades. Awareness is proportional to the charge removed from the case. Although a human being is a composite being, there's only one I, that is you, who runs things. Body thetans just hold one back. You'll still continue to be you, silly. You, inside, can of course separate out body satans, so solo auditing is of course the answer. How good do you have to be to run body thetans off, you may ask? Well, if you don't skimp your grades, clearing, and OT2 particularly, you should be able to command body thetans easily, you fucking idiot. L. Ron Hubbard, founder. We want to reveal to Stan the great secret of life behind our church, the safely guarded Scientology doctrine. Please, your son deserves to be enlightened. Stan, do you want to hear the great secret doctrine of life behind Scientology? Sure. All right, go ahead and tell him. Would you excuse us, please? This is highly classified church information. Usually to hear the secret doctrine, you have to be in the church for several years, Stan. Are you ready to hear the truth? I... I guess. You see, Stan, there is a reason for people feeling sad and depressed. An alien reason. It all began 75 million years ago. Back then, there was a galactic federation of planets, which was ruled over by the evil Lord Zenu. <laughs> Zenu thought his galaxy was overpopulated, and so he rounded up countless aliens from all different planets, and then had those aliens frozen. <laughs> the frozen alien bodies were loaded onto Zenu's galactic cruisers, which looked like DC-8s except with rocket engines. The cruisers then took the frozen alien bodies to our planet, Earth, and dumped them into the volcanoes of Hawaii. The aliens were no longer frozen, they were dead. The souls of those aliens, however, lived on and all floated up towards the sky. But the evil Lord Xenu had prepared for this. Xenu didn't want their souls to return, and so he built giant soul catchers in the sky. Souls were taken to a huge soul brainwashing facility, which Xenu had also built on Earth. There, the souls were forced to watch days of brainwashing material, which tricked them into believing a false reality. Xenu then released the alien souls, which roamed the Earth aimlessly in a fog of confusion. At the dawn of man, the souls finally found bodies which they could grab onto. They attached themselves to all mankind, which still to this day causes all our fears, our confusions, and our problems. Now this is an interview that L. Ron Hubbard's own son gave, exposing his father and Scientology. The one super secret sentence that Scientology is built on is, do as thou wilt. That is the whole of the law. It also comes from the black magician Aleister Crowley, obviously, and it's misspelled there. It means that you're a law unto yourself, that you're above the law, that you create your own law. And what does the new age say? You create your own reality. You don't have to align with the truth or find out what it is. You make your own truth and your own reality. You are above any other human considerations. And since you came into being by an act of will, you can do anything you will. If you decide to go out and kill somebody, bam, that's it. An act of will. Not connected to any emotions or feelings, not governed by any ethics or morality or law. I believed in Satanism. There was no other religion in the house, for fuck's sake. Scientology and black magic. What a lot of people don't realize is that Scientology is black magic, that it's just spread out over a long time period. Try telling this to your average Scientologist. They'd roll their eyes back in their head. To perform black magic generally takes a few hours or at most a few weeks, but in Scientology it's stretched out over a lifetime so you don't see it. Black magic is the inner core of Scientology and it's probably the only part of Scientology that really works. 
Now, Hubbard's son is correct here when he says that explaining black magic is sort of a long and complicated process, and we'll definitely be deep diving into this subject in season three, the deprogramming season. But he says here, the basic rationale is that there are some powers in this universe that are pretty strong. As an example, Hitler was involved in the same black magic and the same occult practices that my father was, the identical ones, which, as I have said, stem clear back to before Egyptian times. It's a very secret thing, hence the secret societies. Very powerful powerful and very workable and very dangerous. Brainwashing is nothing compared to it. He's fucking right about that. The proper term would be soul cracking. It's like cracking open the soul, which then opens various doors to the powers that exist, the satanic and demonic powers. Simply put, it's like a tunnel or an avenue or a doorway. Pulling that power into yourself through another person and using women especially is incredibly insidious. It makes Dr. Fu Manchu look like a freaking kindergarten student. It's the ultimate vampirism, the ultimate mindfuck. Instead of going for blood, you're going for their actual soul. And you take drugs in order to reach that state where you can, quite literally, like a psychic hammer, break their soul and pull the power through. Lovely, isn't it? He designed his Scientology operating Thetan techniques to do the same thing, hence the OT levels that we're talking about. But of course, it takes a couple of hundred hours of auditing and mega thousands of dollars for the privilege of having your head turned into a glass Humpty Dumpty, shattered into a million pieces. This is the DID and uh, multiple personality disorder I've been talking about a lot on this series. It may sound like incredible gibberish, but it made my father a fortune. These incredible soul-cracking levels of gibberish that both enriched Hubbard and simultaneously enslaved hundreds of thousands the world over for the last seven decades is exactly the subject of the next episode where we pick it up from right where we left off. How do you audit OT3? What's actually on it? We're going to be deep diving into all of this. And most importantly, what the fuck happened with Sammy, the little doggy? My friends, I very much appreciate you watching as always. And until the next one, Zenu. Now there is no one of it. And you find in each and every case you're finding the phenomenon of entities, communications, space ships, other planets, locations, beingness in other states, and all of this, and you find this to be a consistent condition, you have fulfilled this definition of the mass universe. Now, this just sounds awfully wild. It just sounds really incredible. Wild.